I'm Keena Nisley, and this is The Life of the Land is in Its Real Estate. Today, we're going to talk about the tax advantages of owning a home. And I have Jason Graves from Ho Sioux Advisors, and he is an enrolled agent. So hi, Jason. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Keena. So yeah, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I grew up here in, um, in Hawaii, in Kailua. I uh, went to Punahou. Uh, went to college on the mainland and um, started working in taxes about 20 years ago and decided to move back to Hawaii uh, about 10 years ago and uh, start my own tax practice. Wow. Okay. So I introduced you as an enrolled agent. What is that exactly? That's a good question. Um, most people don't know what an enrolled agent is. Basically, there's three designations that can represent someone um, in front of the IRS, uh, an attorney, a CPA, and an enrolled agent. An enrolled agent uh, has to go through approximately two days of testing, and it's specifically on taxes, and it's a license that the IRS gives out. It's one of their highest licenses, and it allows me to prepare taxes for anyone um, anywhere around the United States, um, pretty much any tax return. So, wow. Okay. So about taxes. So what are the tax benefits or, of owning a home? Or are there tax benefits of owning a home? There are tax benefits of owning a home. Um, if you own a home, you can write off the real estate taxes and the mortgage interest that you pay. And um, I believe right now you can also um, write off the mortgage insurance if you have any. And it depends on your tax situation um, because we all have our standard deductions and you either take the greater of the standard deduction or your itemized deductions, which includes the real estate taxes and mortgage interest if you have any. So that would be a benefit. Okay. So if someone paid cash for their home or if it was paid off and they, they weren't paying PMI, the interest um, or the interest, then um, they would probably want to go the other route of the standard deductions. What, what most, would you get there? Most likely, but again, um, it depends on their own situation, but most likely it's the mortgage interest that people pay that helps them, um, helps their itemized deductions become higher than their standard deductions and therefore more beneficial to itemize. Okay. All right. So while they're itemizing, I know um, I, I'm a real estate agent. I get all kinds of questions and I'm always like, you need to talk to your tax advisor. Uh, but what about, can you, if you do home improvements, can you write those off on your taxes? Generally, for a principal residence now, um, generally no. They go into what's called the cost basis or the cost of the property that you bought. And when you go to sell the property, then that'll reduce your gain. Okay, so that leads into my next question. So what about if I sell my home? Um, is there, you know, I know there's capital gains taxes. How do those all work? And is there a way to avoid those or, or how do those work? Sure. So when, if you sell your principal residence and you've lived in it for two years, you can protect or not get taxed on up to $250,000 of capital gains. If you're single, if you're married, that doubles to $500,000. So let's say you bought a home for 500,000, you sell it for a million, you would walk away with no capital gains. Oh, okay. So that that's beneficial. So I know people out there through, through COVID have taken mm -hmm. loan forbearance. How, what's the tax implication of taking loan forbearance? Oh, that's that's a very tough one because that's very um, taxpayer specific. 
So you'd ha we'd have to dive into the rules a little bit, depending on um, their specific uh, situation. But some people, if there's loan forgiveness for mortgage interest, uh, that may be uh, non-taxable. However, if we're talking about like credit card debt, um, if someone's forgiven their credit card debt, then most likely that's income. When, when debt is forgiven, the IRS, IRS says most likely that that's income to the taxpayer. So, so the forbearance that they're tacking on to the end of their loan is not something that, that they can claim or is, is it a benefit or is it, ha you know, is it harmful to your taxes to having taking loan forbearance? Mm, that's um, that would be a very taxpayer specific okay. question. Sorry, it it depends. That's probably on, on income. The best answer on that one. Okay, all right. So I I work with a lot of investors, um, and I know some of them have been asking me, "What's the tax implication when their tenants aren't paying the rent?" That's a very good question and that's happening a lot nowadays. So most tax payers, individual tax payers are cash basis. What does that mean? That means whenever they receive income, let's take the rental, um, rental situation. When you receive income or a check, that's when you record it. But if you're not receiving any income, um, or not receiving your rent check if you're a landlord, then you don't record it as income. So for that month, it would you would just uh, keep track of your expenses. So essentially, a lot of these landlords, um, let's say someone doesn't pay their rent for six months, um, at the end of the year, most likely they're probably going to run a loss um, because they have half as much income coming in and probably just as much expenses. Okay. All right. So I then I get this question all the time. And, and we talked about this with so much working from home through COVID-19. Can you write off your home office? Can we write this off our taxes since we're all here working from home now? Oh, that is another great question. Um, and I'm going to have to say it depends. <laughs> uh, it depends if you work for an employer and you usually have an office to go to. Um, probably not. Um, if the employer said, you know what, you're, you're going to work from home. Um, that, that's a tough one. Again, um, yeah, it, it, it really depends. If you have your own business and you don't have uh, uh, a storefront or you don't have a place where you do business, you do business out of your home, that's very strong candidate for a home office. Um, but there's a whole list of rules that go into that as well. So what, yeah, so what, what would constitute if I wanted to write, because I, again, I'm a real estate agent, so I do work from home. Um, what would I need if I wanted to write off a portion of, of my home office that I have, you know, in a third bedroom in my house? That, that's a great question. And you had a great answer. If you have a dedicated space, not a corner of a dining room, but a dedicated room, like a third bedroom, um, where you could put a desk and a computer and really designate that as a workspace, that's a very strong support for having a home office. And the IRS looks for support. So the more support you have, uh, the better chances you would, you would uh, survive an audit, let's say. There is a, they call it a de minimis rule um, or a safe harbor rule, not de minimis, I'm sorry, a safe harbor rule where um, and again, we have to dive into the details for a home office a little bit, but it basically says if you live, let's say, in a studio apartment where you don't have another room, right, 
um, you could probably dedicate a very small space um, if you have a desk and a computer and you could probably take some of those home office expenses. There's, there is actually a court case in New York where um, a taxpayer, uh, they went to court and she said, I work from my apartment, it's a studio. I don't have a, a separate room um, and she won. So, um, so yeah. I need to take a photo of my, my office. <laughs> if the day I get, you know, if there's a day I get audited, um, how do you prove? I mean, I, uh, I, I photo I would, photo would be good. Um, I would go to, if it were my client, I'd go to the county city and county website and pull down a schematic of their property. Um, so you have a third party telling the auditor, here's a schematic of their, their property. Here's the, you know, the, maybe the third bedroom or whatnot. Um, they don't have any children. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the IRS, if you can have, if you can supply some really good support, um, I, I think you'd probably, um, survive an audit. It's facts that the, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to find a good word, reasonableness. The IRS wants you to take a reasonable position. And I believe if you take a reasonable position, most likely you'll survive. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. So I'm going to kind of switch gears here. Um, I do work with a lot of investors. Um, is, are there tax benefits to, um, first of all, like let's talk about flipping homes, people who mm -hmm. buy homes rehab them and put them on the market. Is there a tax benefit um, to doing that? To, to buying multiple properties? Um, let's, let's, take, let's take the flipping because okay. that's, that's, that can be a hot button issue. Um, the flipping is basically, here, here's the issue with the flipping. It's either capital gains or, which is a lower tax bracket or, um, short-term gain or ordinary income. And those are all kind of different tax, tax implications there, okay? Uh, a long-term gain would be if you bought a piece of property, flipped it, let's say, um, after a year and a half and sold it, okay? Capital gains rate is a small, smaller rate, right? Um, so that's probably the ideal. If you flipped it in less than a year, less uh, 365 days or less, then that would, your ordinary rate would be your, your tax rate, okay? So most likely a little higher than your capital gains rate. There is a kind of a gray area in this space because if someone, let's say, doesn't have a W-2 job, doesn't have any other operating business on their tax return, you know, something that they do um, for a living. All they do is flip houses. That's their main source of income. The IRS might, again, this is very facts and circumstances uh, related. The IRS might come back and say, hey, this is actually your job and you're subject to self-employment tax, which, uh, which is kind of another, uh, you know, you being a, a, a realtor is probably, uh, you probably know about self-employment tax because um, <laughs> uh, self-employed uh, people um, have to pay that most of the time. Yeah. So um, what about my investors that are buying and holding and, and they're doing rentals? Are there tax mm -hmm. benefits or is that a, a tax risk to uh, rentals? There are wonderful tax benefits for rental property. Um, there's three major ones, I think. Um, one, again, this is facts and circumstances, but uh, I would think 90% of the landlords out there fall into this category, that if you have taxable income from uh, real estate, uh, rental real estate, which the IRS deems as passive income, um, that's not subject to self-employment tax. 
So self-employment tax is a 15, generally about a flat 15% um, rate. So you're not subject to the 15% rate on any taxable income. That's number one. The second benefit um, is a 1031 exchange. What is that? That's a like kind exchange. What does that mean? That means if I wanna sell a property uh, that I've been renting, um, generally it's two years. Again, that's kind of a gray area, but generally if I've been renting it out, using it as investment property for two years, I can sell that property, buy another property or multiple properties, and any gain in the property that I sell is automatically rolled over into those properties and I don't have to pay tax on that. So that's the, that's the second, that's the second. The third, and I think it's one of the most, most powerful is depreciation. So when someone buys uh, investment property and rents it out, uh, uh, a portion of the purchase price is allocated to building and another part is allocated to land. Now land doesn't depreciate, right? Land is land. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't lose its value for the most part, but a building does. And the IRS does lose its value. The IRS has deemed that the price that you allocate to the land, to the building, is going to depreciate at uh, over 27 and a half years. What does that mean? That means that if you have, let's say, $270,000 allocated to the building that you purchased and that you're renting out, you're going to take approximately $10,000 of depreciation expense every year. What does that depreciation expense do? It's an expense. So let's say you have a net income of $5,000, okay, from, from your rental for the year, and you have $10,000 in depreciation expense. That $10,000 of depreciation expense will come in and wipe out the $5,000 of, of income. Wow. Okay. Powerful, huh? Yeah, so it does sound like, you know, investing in some rentals is probably a good um, tax benefit. Um, all right, so I did have one of my clients ask, what are, are there legal ways to save on, legal is the key word there, uh, mm -hmm. legal ways to save on taxes as an investor? Le wow, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> I, I just illustrated one. Yes. Um, <laughs> you have to see it in the ways. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the, the like-kind exchange is another. And and this goes for any, those are those are real estate specific, but any investment almost, uh, and I have to qualify myself, and this is not tax advice to anybody in particular. Okay. I, I always tell people you need to um, uh, visit with your tax advisor uh, for your specific situation. But in terms of investing in almost any asset, the best way to do that is to hold it for long term. And you get the capital, the capital gains rate, long term capital gains rate, and that's generally going to be lower than your ordinary rate. All right. So for our last few minutes, we are going to switch gears again, and we're going to go into LLCs. So I, I always get the question, should I buy this property in my LLC or in my own name? And again, I always say you need to talk to your tax advisor because that's not my job um, or my expertise. So what is your advice? What should people, if they want to buy, even a, 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 let's first, let's talk about their own homes. Should they purchase those in their own names or is there a benefit to purchasing in an LLC? Uh, I would not purchase it in the LLC because that, uh, to my knowledge, to my knowledge now, um, and I don't know the whole, whole code, I don't think anybody does. Um, if you purchase the home, your principal residence, and put it in an LLC and live in it, you will not be able to take the $250,000 or $500,000 um, exclusion, capital gain exclusion, when you go to sell it. 
now let's switch gears over to rental real estate, which is, I think, where the, the, the main question is. Um, LLCs are a legal entity. There's no tax benefit owning an LLC. So there's no LLC tax return. There ha never has been. Um, it's purely, I think, for, for asset protect, not purely, I'm sorry, I'm back up there. It's mainly for asset protection. Um, there's probably some other advantages that the attorneys would, would talk about. So they'd, I would say, visit your tax advisor and your attorney. Um, but from, from a tax standpoint, LLCs, again, are legal entities. But once you create the LLC, and this is how I explain it to my clients, when you create an LLC, you're basically creating another entity, another person, a pseudo person, let's say. Now, the IRS says, fine, that, that's great. You have this pseudo person, but we need to know how, how do you want this pseudo person to be taxed? Do you want this pseudo person to be in your own personal tax return? That's a disregarded entity. Um, if only one person owns the LLC. Or you can tax the um, tax the LLC as a partnership, or as an S corp, or a regular corporation. So what happens when you create an LLC? You have to kind of hold up your hand to the IRS and say, "Hey, Mr. or Mrs. IRS, we'd like to um, have you tax this this LLC as a corporation." So that's that's on the that's the tax advisor. That's uh, that's pretty much my job. Okay. Um, so that's with, if they want to buy rentals, should they buy rentals? We're saying they should buy rentals in an LLC or what, what do you advise clients then? For, for again, for tax wise, it, it has no bearing okay. tax wise whatsoever. Um, for, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, asset protection, you know, you'd have to talk to your attorney, but um, I believe and I've, I've read enough to, to think that there's a, there's a good amount of asset protection, but then that, that's the attorney's realm. I don't want to steal too much fire from them. Okay. So are there any other, um, any other advice you could give people? Just, just general tax advice, whether it's owning properties, rentals, um, we didn't really touch on what if they're investing in the, the stock market. Are most of those, I, we have time, we could spend a couple of minutes. If, if their investments are not real estate, um, how do the taxes work on those? Okay, uh, so let me touch on the LLC for a bit okay. for, for, for real estate um, because I get a lot of questions. I deal predominantly with business owners and real estate investors. Um, I would keep things simple as you can. Um, people like to create a lot of LLCs, like one LLC per property. Um, I would caution um, on that. And, and only because, because of this fact, um, every LLC you create, generally speaking, generally speaking, um, you should have its own bank account, its own federal ID number. Um, so that's a lot of bookkeeping. Yeah. Okay. So you want to, you want to keep it as simple as possible. So you, cause I have always heard and, and people, again, people ask me and again, I'm like, yeah, you need to um, consult an expert if they should open. Cause I, I work with people who buy houses, flip them and, and then resell them if they should have a separate LLC for each property. Um, and that is a question I get. So you do not recommend, you're recommending it's okay to put three or four properties into one LLC? I think the rent, if, if you're renting them, um, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, particularly if you're going to go out of state, you know, if, if you want to have, uh, if you want to invest in, you know, properties in Kansas, um, then maybe you create one LLC for all your Kansas properties. Um, if you do flips, I've heard, you know, some people might want to create one one LLC per flip. Uh, I think that's that's 
you know, that's okay because you're not going to keep it around too too mm -hmm. long. I mean, it's just if you have 10 properties in Hawaii, having 10 different LLCs with 10 different bank accounts, that's uh, yeah. that's a, that's a lot of bookkeeping. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. So is there any other quick advice you want to give our viewers? Um, keep things simple. Um, really try to um, be well organized. That helps your tax professional. And, you know, when things start getting, I know a lot of people do like to do their tax returns themselves, but it, when it starts getting to be a headache, I look for um, a tax professional who's uh, has a lot of uh, real estate and business experience. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for joining us on the life of the land is the real estate. I will be back in a couple weeks and we will have an investor who is investing in multiple doors on the mainland while he lives here in Hawaii as you talked about. And we'll be sure to cover whether he has them in one LLC or several. Um, and he's going to tell us how he's been able to do that and manage that from Hawaii. And I wish you all so a, a happy holiday tomorrow. And I will see you all in a couple of weeks.